Did you fucking see that thing? In 2008, then Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, launched the Digital Education Revolution, which among other things would deliver laptops to public school students above a certain age. In 2010, when I was 11, I got my own, and I remember it fondly. My parents were probably happy not to have my fat ass sitting constantly in front of the family computer, but I can only speculate. They all came with pre-installed software, and while my school didn't get much mileage out of Songsmith, Stellarium, or <laughs> Pivot Stick Figure Animator, I did get a lot of jollies out of using it to draw, to the dismay of my teachers and probably fellow students. Around the same time, in New South Wales, there were some other kids in high school with the same idea, and a lot more talent. If only Kevin knew what he had done. You're fucked up. How long have you been smoking for? 48 years. And how old are you? 52. You're gonna fucking die of lung cancer, mate. You're gonna get punched in the face by the long dick of cancer. The Big Les show began on July 2012. What started as an inside joke between mates would explode in popularity and quickly become our greatest cultural export. By the end of its run, this MS Paint animated stoner comedy was pulling in millions of views consistently, and had its hour-long series finale screened in theatres across Australia, New Zealand, and even the UK. Based on a series of comics drawn by Jared Wright featuring a character based on his friend's dad, the characters would be further developed by fellow madman Isaac Weir and the greatest Simpsons fan artist on Earth, Tom Hollis from now on referred to collectively as the Free Wise Men. The first season is more or less a series of vignettes that introduce us to Big Les, Quentin, and the people of Browntown, and... Oh boy. Yeah, as you've probably noticed, some of the art, especially early on, is... quite sloppy. In fact, I bet there's some people confused as to why I'm going to be talking about this series for... I promise this is worth it. In addition to voicing most of the cast, Jared would spend his nights animating on his laptop trackpad, and it shows. Despite the first couple of episodes being made up of drawings that aren't fit for Mum's fridge, I can't be too hard on it considering how the series would evolve. Also, it's going to be extremely hard for me to riff on this show, because it's already funny enough on its own without me taking the piss with my horrible editing. But I'm going to try anyway. We meet our true blue Australian hero, the eponymous Big Les himself, as he pesters his effeminate neighbour, Norton, while gardening. These first few episodes aren't super important in context to the rest of the series, but we do learn one important thing. Leslie Mackerel is a cunt. He abandons his son Quentin to smoke weed with Sasquatches at a volcano. He can't tell the difference between Xbox and GameCube. He knocks Quentin off his board while surfing, in what we later find out is shark-infested water. Cunt can't even handle the fucking Scooby-Doo ride. Pussy. <laughs> We see the conflict with Norton escalate as the season continues. Les ruins his flowers, Norton shits in his mailbox, Les pegs it into his window and Norton calls the cops, but is so hated in the town that the cop joins Les and wax golf balls into his house. That last one being particularly interesting. What exactly did Norton do to earn such scorn? That's not a rhetorical question. At this point, we've already established that he's the mildly annoying sitcom rival to Les, but what did he do to turn the whole town against him? Maybe this isn't the first time he's done a shit in Les's mailbox. Maybe Les's mailbox isn't the first one he's shat in. Clarence doesn't seem all that shocked when he finds his present for Les while delivering letters. Over the course of season one, we're introduced to the people of Browntown. We've already met Norton, Les's neighbour and arch-nemesis mailbox shitter. His often neglected son, Quentin, who, judging by his face here, clearly has some strong feelings towards his father. Four drug-addicted Sasquatches that live next door, including Sassy. Many people's favourite character and Les's best friend. When he isn't participating in chemical warfare. 
badass Scottish lighthouse keeper warning guy, and Mike Nolan, who is just every Australian over 40. Feels like I'm forgetting to mention someone. Friends. Nah, that's everyone. Ah, oh. <clears throat> there's also these yellow things that appear in the background of certain episodes. Kinda weird, right? Looks familiar, and copyrighted. Anyone remember Bananas in Pajamas? Eventually, the tension between Les and Norton reaches a boiling point when Norton leaves him another present. The two do battle in the street as Quentin yells at them to stop. When Les and Norton both survive a car crash and explosion, he demands answers. And Norton spills the beans. There's nothing to tell. Leslie and I are brothers. From another world. Called Kingdom Come. Huh. Well. What do you know? Yeah, this is gonna be one of those series. The idea to have Les and Norton as aliens was that of Isaac Weir, and would dictate the direction of the series going forward. Les tells Quentin everything. He and Norton were brothers, set to inherit the planet of Kingdom Come from their father. The two would drug each other to sabotage the other's chance at becoming king. High as fuck, they would destroy the city and be exiled from Kingdom Come. Crash landing in Australia. How fitting. Now we have context for the animosity. When Quentin asks where all of his Centrelink money is going, Les shows him the basement. Why do you know we had a fucking basement? Mm-hmm. You wanna know what I've been spending your money on? This. It's over there, mate. This! It's over there, mate. Sassy for fuck's sake. This! It's over just in time for the end of the season, Les now has a goal. I'm going back. But that can wait because it, it says, says here in the paper, paper that Mike, Mike Nolan, Nolan has gone, gone missing. Also, Sassy found a plane outside of Coles. The Sasquatches are kind of inexplicable in that way. He invites Les to take it for a spin with Donnie and Les yet again abandons his son in favour of monkeys. Who can blame him? It's going well until... Fuck. <laughs> These yellow things are called tumours. The invention of Tom Hollis, who would draw various grotesque bastardizations of Homer Simpson. Before Big Les began proper, Jared would pay tribute to Tom's creations by animating them performing Parkway Drive songs. Juma Island wasn't the episode Jared originally intended to close off season one. The original finale would see a tumour invasion of Browntown, but since this was approaching the end of the school year, Jared's laptop would be handed in to have its hard drive formatted, and the episode would be lost. Speaking of lost, the TV show Lost follows a group of characters who crash land on a deserted island, and Jared is a big fan. Clearly inspired, he would create a Lost episode to replace the Lost episode. That joke is so good, he beat me to it. So the idea of the Tumor Island came from Lost. And <laughs> coincidentally enough, started from the Lost episode. Get it? Because I lost that first original episode. Similarly, when I got to the end of season one in the original script, it disappeared. I had to rewrite everything. Maybe this episode is just cursed. Les eventually finds Nolsey, who is so exhausted from fighting these yellow things that you can barely hear his voice over the background noise. That's no, mate. Don't worry. He gives Les a gun and gives himself cancer. 
We learn later that Nolsey was supposed to be headed for Thailand when his plane crashed on Tumor Island, which means he somehow got this gun onto a plane post 7-11. They're suddenly attacked and Nolsey does absolutely nothing as Les fights them all off. I'm gonna assume he was too busy sucking down another Siggy without exhaling off screen. Les fights off the tumors and runs into the big boss. He tells us what we already knew from the last episode, but that Kingdom Come was destroyed, with only six survivors, two of which are already accounted for. When he's done, Les drops the fucking mic. <laughs> Guess what happens to bees when they sting something? What? They fucking die. <laughs> This island whenever the fuck I want, you yellow piece of shit. Then he runs out of ammo and steals Clarence's boat. This whole time, as Les was fighting for his life, Sassy and Donnie were just doing drugs in the bush. Thanks for helping. And that's the end of season one. It's not really much to look at, but I'm more forgiving of this series because of its intent and its origins. This was never meant to be seen by anyone outside of one high school in Tweed Heads. And, at least at this point, it hadn't. The series is yet to explode in popularity just yet, but that would come very soon. Season 2 of The Big Les Show began in early 2013, and already some changes are apparent. After an absurdly long title screen gag, the season begins proper with a flash forward to Warning Guy pulling Les out of his crash ship into a city overrun with tumors. This season would be one continuous story arc. This is the moment the series' balls dropped. Four episodes in and the art style makes its first leap forward. Jared is still a psychopath who draws with his laptop trackpad, but now in widescreen. <laughs> Though still stuck at 480p, the art is a lot more detailed and clearer. Back in the present, we open with Les frustrated as everyone in Browntown has been invited to Norton's birthday party but him. Kind of a weird thing to be upset about, since we've already established that Les hates Norton. But Les being as egotistical as he is, this probably hurt his pride. Sassy's starting a food business selling horrific concoctions of food products and illicit substances, including the infamous Tripper Snipper, a deli wrap containing speed, weed, heroin, cocaine, mushrooms, pinoclean, petrol, battery acid, acid, salvia, meth, some herbs and spots. This knocks Les out for 11 days. With Norton's party fast approaching, Nolsey has repaired Les's ship. Lacking money for fuel, he takes Les to a casino where Lady Lux smothers him in her gigantic breasts. Me. Now completely sick of his bullshit, Quentin ditches him in favour of Norton, just in time for his party, which nobody else came to. Big shock. Ah! Furious, Les breaks in and finds evidence of Norton on the island. It seems he wasn't completely cut off like Les. He smashes his belongings, shits on his birthday cake and beats Norton in the street, who takes him to court. He's given a life sentence for mass murdering puppies, of which Les is innocent, but again, the justice system, for whatever reason, is biased against Norton. Which is probably why there were blueprints for cyborg cops in his home. Ones that won't whack golf balls into his windows. I can only assume that he had the season one cop killed off screen. I'd call it contrived, but I think the show already knows this. Jared, Isaac, and Tom are sitting right there. Take that sick fuck away. So be it!
While Les is in prison, the show's meteoric rise would truly begin. According to Google Trends data, May of 2013 would be the beginning of an explosion in popularity, perhaps aided by the new Facebook page, which Sassy would advertise at the end of each episode. The inside joke had graduated to a cult hit, and would only grow from there. This is also where I come into the picture. My first exposure to the Big Les show being through the Facebook page Fuck Off Clarence, a meme page dedicated to shitting on this grit mailman. I didn't even know what the Big Les show was at the time, but I knew I hated this potato-headed fuck. This page has unfortunately been lost to time. I still remember being at school and hearing such lines as You couldn't even grow a dick if you tried, Norton. You fucking drugger. Oh, Lord, please help me now. Got you one of them bloody game box things. Moving, schmoving. Oh, would you like fries with that, Quinton? You said you got it from the tip. It doesn't cost a thing. Yeah, to save money. Quoted ad nauseum all over the school, with people sharing clips to each other on their phones. Not impressed, I, of course, had already graduated to Jared's earlier material. I bet you have a spoiled dick. Lol. Get fucked. My dick is infinity times bigger than your belly button sized dick you old cunt. My dick can fight off sharks. Well my dick is so big it can crush cars with its weight. My dick can fuck 12 chicks at the same time. All your dick doses get covered in shit from your boyfriend's asshole. I can split an elephant. Yuck mate. That is fucked. It turns out Les wasn't the only one that was thrown in prison. On the Sasquatch's way to the water park, a disgruntled scruffy threw his shoes out of the window, which ended up hitting a cop car. I can't think of anything funny to add here. This episode is already perfect. The whole series is up on YouTube by the way, you really should be watching it. License please. Don't have one. Vehicle registration? The fuck's a V-hail resuscitation? Sir, are you under the influence of any drugs or alcohol? Nah, not just that, mate. I also burnt some plastic hungry jacks toys and inhaled the fuck out of my. <laughs> I'm gonna have to ask you to remain in the vehicle while I check the back of your car. No worries, mate. Just don't get too close to the left side of the back corner because I saw a spider crawl in there. Holy mother of God. You see the spider, mate? I'm still looking for the spider in the back of Sassy's car. I'm probably going to look again while editing this video. Jared, if you're watching this and I find out there's no spider here, I'm gonna fuck, fuck you, you up, up and, and possibly, possibly kill, kill you with, with the wind, wind from, my from my punches. Les is a little pissed off that he saw Sassy in Norton's photos, but this matter has dropped so quickly I almost considered not putting it in the script. By now, the Robocops have infiltrated every layer of law enforcement. We've seen them as cops, bouncers, and even prison guards. Hey look, it's that cop that helped me whack golf balls into Norton's house. Oh yeah, it's the same bloke who got us here as well. He seems to be fucking everywhere. Um, hello. Can I please trouble you for some more chickpeas on lentils? Ah! What? Ah! My bones! Ah! Ah! There's vomit in my wounds! Ah! 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 There's spew in my bullet holes! Ah! Seems really mean. While in prison, the boys meet one and Guy's cousin Sergio, to my knowledge the only character voiced by Isaac, a cheery game hunter who wants to kill a tumour. Clarence has been feeding him information behind bars. He's in prison too. Uh, he just got thrown in for being Clarence. Poor thing. Not sure how he got off the island, but we find out that he tried to stop Les from going. But Sassy had drugged him and he didn't feel like listening. If you go anywhere near that hole, you will unplug the virus that will kill everyone on this earth. While everyone was in jail, the tumors took over. Ah, uh, okay. Whatever. Before they can plan their escape, one breaks into the prison and starts fucking shit up, with warning guy using it as a distraction to break everyone out. He takes them to the Volcano Bong, where Les's ship has been fixed and just needs fuel. Which we already know from earlier in the season. Amazing. The solution is found in Sassy's culinary slash psychedelic abomination, the Tripper Snipper. Sergio leads a hunting party into Browntown. Clarence wanted to go to space with Les, but was denied nah, entry. Space nah, travel. nah. 
No fucking way. You stay here and be useless. And you smell like almonds and soap. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say? Did you say? Yeah, I said it. <laughs> and your gay sweater looks fucking gross. <laughs> oh, those brutal words hurt my skin. Nolsey had better things to do. Ooh, fuck yeah, mate. Okay, let's fuck this bum hole. Les and the boys take off to find Kingdom Come and get some answers, only to find it destroyed. That's it. I'm done. Also, it's not even supposed to be funny, but for some reason the way Les says Fuck, we're gonna have to go into hyperspace to get home. It's so funny to me. <laughs> Imagine your dad saying this. Fuck, you expected not to hurt. Whoa! <laughs> What the fuck did he do that for? Thanks to Les's violent knee-jerk reaction, they crash land in the city. Now we're all caught up. Warning Guy journeys deeper into the city to save Browntown from becoming Springfield. Clarence joins the hunting party and a Tumidactyl takes Les to their leader. No exaggeration, Cecil the Sasquatch is the most generic fucking nothing villain ever written. He doesn't even try to hide it. Why the fuck did you fill the city with these fucking yellow things? Because I'm the bad guy. That's what we do. We fuck shit up, usually in the city. His one defining trait is his cute name. This is my army. This is my war. I am Cecil the Sasquatch. I think that's the main thing holding the show back. The villains of the show are nowhere near as memorable, interesting, or quotable as the main cast. It's pretty clear where the Free Wise men are focusing their efforts. Cecil's messenger from the end of Tumor Island didn't even have a name until the final episode of the series, but I still drew fan art of him, so what do I know? Leslie? <laughs> that's so much gayer than Cecil. <laughs> Our heroes all reunite as Les chases Cecil upstairs. He corners him on the roof, where we find out that Cecil is next in line to be king. What? With the reveal of King Larinox causing and surviving the destruction of Kingdom Come, we now have three out of six accounted for. Before Les can beat the shit out of another one of his relatives, he escapes with Cecil. Clarence can speak Tuma and gives them a message so they'll leave in peace. And Mike Nolan, high as fuck, flies his helicopter to the pink building. Clarence was not present for the pickup, so I just assume he had to walk. Knock knock. Who is it? Child Protection Services. What? <laughs> Hello, Quinton. Liz. And finally. Les one-hit KOs Norton and takes Quentin home, who enters to find a brand new Xbox, thus concluding Season 2. Now that we're halfway through the series, I want to bring up this terrible quote. If you're anything like me, you can probably feel spiders under your skin right now, because this mindset has done incredible damage to pretty much the entire film and TV industry over the last 10 years. Jared is a self-confessed MCU fan, but unlike his inspiration, I think he actually manages to pull this off. Maybe it's because The Big Les Show is more my style of humour. Maybe it's because a cartoon drawn in MS Paint doesn't create the same level of immersion as a billion dollar green screen vomit bucket. And as such, it's not as jarring when it's broken. I could probably be a lot harsher on this series if I really wanted to, but <laughs> look at it. That's not to say it's impervious to criticism, but I don't feel like my intelligence is being insulted when I run into holes. Despite its massive newfound audience, the original spirit of a bunch of Aussie teens in their bedrooms talking shit to make each other laugh, even if it will eventually waver, hasn't been lost. I think that's the show's biggest strength. It's genuine. 
And in these days of pureed studio garbage, where even independents are watering their works down for mass appeal, a series like this, created by a few stoners for a laugh, reaching the heights it did should be celebrated. We wouldn't have to wait long until season 3. Having completed their first continuous story arc with a tease at the tumor's return, and Les himself promising a return to form for the series, episode 1 of the third season would be uploaded in July 2014, reintroducing us to the denizens of Browntown. Aside from another leap forward in production value, partially due to Jared now drawing with a proper tablet pen instead of, like, an insane man, and Tom Hollis on backgrounds, sometimes, Season 3 also improves on the storytelling. Because of the way The Big Les Show is, it's hard to tell if this was intentional. But the first we see of Les this season is him attempting to out-ung a magpie. After a decisive victory, he proclaims himself king of the fucking jungle. Later in the season, we also see him eating from a giant bowl labelled The King. In another episode, during a drug trip, he's tormented by visions of Norton telling him that he's going to be king. Despite once again settling down in suburbia, he still has his eyes on the crown. It seems like the cops are off his ass for now, giving him a season's head start, for some reason. We would also get two new cases of lost media related to the show during season three. The first episode of this series was also uploaded to Channel Frederator back in 2014. It has since been taken down, and I have no proof, but I swear this is true. It might have even helped introduce the show to an international audience. C can someone verify this? I feel like I'm going crazy. The creators of the show would also be interviewed for a 10 minute documentary, entitled The Big Les Doco, which has since been taken down but featured the Free Wise Men, along with a lot of early drawings of the characters, their origins, and even behind-the-scenes footage, most of which has been covered since in Jared's own video on the subject in more detail. It occasionally shows up again, but is usually quickly taken down by Jared. I have no idea why, but even the subreddit has banned sharing links. The early episodes of Season 3 act as self-contained reintroductions to the characters, my favourite of which being Ahow, which follows Clarence as his winning lottery ticket is stolen by a bird. And then the plot happens. Les and Sassy take the wrong batch of edibles to a movie theatre, and Les has another trip. He's haunted by visions of Norton, tumours, and the voice of Clarence telling him they need to return to the island. After which, the series kinda drags, with a lot of slow burn episodes that kinda feel like checking boxes in the lead up to the finale. In that way, season 3 has the highest highs <laughs> and lowest lows of the whole series. But after a dip in the middle, the last few episodes of the season are the big Les show at its absolute best. Kinda like another series I spoke about on the channel. In Les's spare time, he's been working on a secret project with Nolsey. Glen World, a miniature city in his basement in <laughs> inhabited by these fucking Kendall motherfuckers named Glen. After Les shows the boys the fruits of his midlife crisis, they lament that Les is dragging his heels a little. Missing the excitement of the previous seasons, Les says he would rather relax and compares himself to Shrek. But with a little convincing and a push from Clarence earlier in the season, they agree to return to the island for old time's sake, with shitloads of guns and drugs for what by now is shaping up to be one hell of a finale. The penultimate episode of the season is a flashback following this Kingdom come scientist as he works on this yellow formula until Glenn... G Glenn? Sends him back to the lab, his negligence leaving him hideously deformed. Are you alright, Hey, news. Still want to go on that hot date? Ah! What the fuck is that? Ah! Oh, it's oh, it's it's he's instantly exiled to Earth and lands on Tumor Island, where he's revealed to be immortal. Then he drops his formula down a hole. Great job, dickhead. And then Jared loses his marbles. During the production of the season, he had been experimenting with psychedelics, leading to what some would call a Kundalini awakening. The experience of which is best explained by the man himself. 
but the shock would lead to him withdrawing socially and handling most of the production of what would become the season finale himself during which the scope would continue to increase. What was predicted to be a 20 minute episode would balloon to 55, all the while wrestling with his entire worldview being shattered. From the way Jared talks about it in his documentary, the production of Tumor Island 2 sounds like nine months of hell, finally releasing in August 2015. In my opinion, it's the best episode of the series. You fucking slut. You were fucking on that island, weren't you? It's not an island. You best watch your back, Leslie, because I'm coming after you. Jim Island 2 is the whole reason I'm doing this video, so thanks for sitting for all that filler. It begins with Les psyching himself up for the upcoming mission, screaming his name into his reflection before punching the mirror. The shattering of his reflection, and soon his worldview, is not unlike what was happening behind the scenes. He once again abandons Quentin, who kinda seems like he wanted to go. I guess that Sasquatch weed made him grow a pube. He meets up with the boys, and Clarence, as they share a joint and prepare for takeoff. Donnie performs maybe the greatest fourth wall break of the series, or at least it was. You had to have been there. They all pile onto the plane and Les says that he's going to picture every tumour he kills as Norton, having promised him earlier in the series that if he finds him on the island, he'll kill him. They land on the island as the Warningtons stay in the air. They're all immediately noticed by Cecil, who decides to put it off until tomorrow. With everyone on the ground, Sassy gives Les a present and a warning. Once you open that door and you walk through it, you can never go back. Clarence is pretty eager to get the plot going, but everyone else would rather do shrooms. Not sure if Nolsey is a manlet, or if Big Les is living up to his name. He tells Les about a dream he had, where he realised everyone he met in the dream was just his subconscious. I think you can see where this is going. They all continue wasting time until sunset when Les sees a light fall from the sky, following it deeper into the island. Something I want to point out is they left early in the morning. It's now night time and we haven't seen a single tumour on Tumor Island. Even Sassy thinks it's weird. I guess they were all at the Parkway Drive show. When it's over, Les finds some in the bush, and Chang and Ang Simpson take down the plane. The boys are only mildly bothered. Les's journey leads him to a clearing. Finding himself lost, he smokes the joint. Up until now, The Big Les Show has been pretty fond of knocking on the fourth wall, but this is more like a nuclear airstrike. Sassy, or a projection of Sassy, shows Les the truth. None of his experiences, memories, or feelings are real. His whole life he's been pixels on a screen, drawn by someone else. This is kinda horrifying, right? <laughs> I think the craziest part about this reveal is it was hinted as early as season two. During the courtroom scene, the jury is made up of the creators of the show and this blank mannequin. This is Les. This thing seems to follow him around and is there for his most vulnerable moments during season two. It's definitely unintentional, but I'll take it. Sassy gives Les control of the canvas and picks his brain. Les has convinced himself that to be happy, he has to kill Norton, but this will only turn fate against him. Something worth noting is during this conversation, Les doesn't bring up the crown once. This too is something he only thinks he wants. Earlier in the series, he says all he's wanted to do is relax. 
He's like Shrek. He says he wants to get rid of Norton, but this is just another manifestation of his perceived responsibility as the exiled prince of Kingdom Come. He wants to be free. He doesn't have to kill Norton for that. Just stay the course. He has everything he could want on Earth. That's what I took from it anyway. When Les awakens, he finds the source of the light he was chasing. Norton. True to his word, Les opens fire and chases him across the island. The boys wake up to an infestation of tumors, and the Warningtons, who survive the crash, go looking for Les and run into Cecil, where it turns out Warning Guy is the fifth kingdom coming in. Les corners Norton on a cliff as hell breaks loose on the island. Despite all the action and the general lax atmosphere of the show, this interrogation of Norton had me on the edge of my seat the first time watching. The tumors were created accidentally as part of a super soldier experiment gone wrong. An outbreak destroyed Kingdom Come, and he's been working with the King. He, Cecil, and the Robocops are all part of a plan to collect the tumors. For what, he's unsure, but he wants Les to join them. Les tells him no. Norton is everything he would become if he made the wrong decisions. A fuckwit. What does that mean, really? Alright. I got weird and personal at the end of my Dead Man Wonderland videos, so it's only fair that I do the same for this series, considering how much of an influence it's been. Whenever I hear the words, family is everything, I can't help but feel my skin crawl. For my entire adolescence, whenever I heard those words, it was usually used as a manipulation tactic, so the man of the house could get what he wants, while the rest of us have to eat shit. When I see Les and Norton, I can't help but think of this dynamic. Les is seemingly on the road to abandoning his roots, having found a new life and positive relationships on Earth. I guess. The other is a desperate struggling underling in someone else's operation. Spoilers, but later on in the series, King Larinox says he doesn't even care about Norton. Worst of all, he doesn't understand Robocop. Don't you see what this fucking means, Norton? Fucking, all right, one, fucking robots. Two, fucking cops, mate. Those two just don't fucking mix, mate. What about Robocop? It's a Robocop! Hey. <laughs> no, no, what? Despite Sassy's warning, Les kills Norton in the most underhanded way he could, and the Warningtons come to pick him up. Kinda glossed over the death of Cecil, but uh, that's what I think of him. He says it's his aim to stop humanity realizing its true potential, whatever that means. But wouldn't that kind of make him the antagonist to Sassy in this story? What I'm saying is, Cecil versus Sassy would have been sick. He could have blown him up with Sass, mate. Oh! What the fuck, Sassy? What's going on out here, cunt? Trying to fucking sleep in. Saw the alley, mate. Nah, no, I've got to turn the gas off. Fucking spider. They take Norton's ship as a helicopter comes to pick up the rest. This guy's flying it. I feel as if Daednu has a similar role to the dummy in this story. A chess piece of fate used to get the other characters out of danger. After talking with Clarence, he says, quote, I don't even know where I am. What is my life? <laughs> he takes Clarence to the tumor hive to clean up his mess. Finally. <laughs> The two parties regroup and prepare to leave, but then the island starts moving. Tumor Island is an island tumor. They all get home and Clarence blows it up with a gas stove and Les takes the credit. That was easy. <laughs> uh, uh, and so ends season three. With Norton's ashes scattered over the Pacific and Les doomed to face the consequences of his murder. What a ride, huh? Despite the turmoil behind the scenes, they fucking knocked it out of the park for the finale. 
Les might be about to be hit by some bad karma, but his creators would be rewarded. The rise of the Big Les show getting the attention of Comedy Central Australia, looking for a new web series. They would oblige. Uh, as you know, I'm Mark Nolan and, uh... Me mates call me Nolsey. You're fucking joking. With Jared animating, Always Tom providing background right. art, and it's Isaac right. editing. The Mike Nolan Show would begin the following year, a five-episode mockumentary following Nolsey and the second instance of the three wise men appearing as characters in the show. I'm gonna skip over most of it. But here are the highlights. We meet a new character, Crazy Steve. He's a sick lad. If Nolsey is just everyone in Australia, then Crazy Steve is everyone in Queensland. Clarence asks Donnie if he can have a poo, and Mike Nolan is immune to electricity. Oh, you gotta fucking Mind shoot you me a taser, mate. Why don't you fucking shoot me, mate? Go fucking shoot me, you fucking... Oh, oh, yeah, nah, oh, yeah, it hurts so much. Oh, yeah, fuck, oh. I've been a fucking sparky for 15 years, you fucking dog cunt. This is also about the time that the Free Wise Men start calling themselves Ripstart Productions. Don't know what a Ripstart is? That's too bad, shoulda watched the show. Despite me not having much to say, I think The Mike Nolan Show and its sequel are testaments to the cast of characters they've created. Some of these episodes are just the characters of a camera pointed in their face just talking, and somehow it's still engaging. It kinda makes me wish I could just spend a day in this town, but I'd probably leave in an ambulance. Is you alright? It's only drugs. The fourth and final season of The Big Les Show would begin in March 2017, and would be the shortest of the series, at least in terms of episode count, at five episodes long, as opposed to the series average of 10 or 11. Despite there being less, the ones we do get are much longer, with most being upwards of 10 minutes. Before I go any further, I want to bring up season one for comparison. The animation and art have come a long way since the days of school laptop trackpads. Despite this, this season is where we would come to see a lot of asset reuse. Some are even still being used to this day. But with Jared taking care of so much of the show on his own, even with Tom providing occasional background art, in Microsoft Paint no less, I can't knock it too hard. It looks good. Like Season 2, Season 4 is another continuous story arc from beginning to end, but more of a slow burn and less as punishment. If season 2 is where the show's balls dropped, season 4 is when they hit the toilet water. We begin in the desert, where a dehydrated Les arrives at an old train station. He's got a sexy new 4 cannon, which I thought was a robot arm back in the day, and on top of that, he's ripped. Okay. Waiting for him in the station is a new character, the mysterious Taipan Pete. There were a lot of theories going around on who this guy was. Was he Crazy Steve, King Larinox, or the elusive Sixth Kingdom come in? Les himself would even poke fun at some of these theories while tripping balls later in the series, but I'm getting ahead of myself. He also brings up another, which I won't mention. It's the correct one. He offers Les a beer and asks what brings him to the desert, sending us back to Browntown. With Norton being dead in absentia, his murder taking place on international waters, and his body vaporised by Clarence, who everyone assumes is dead, Les wrote up a fake will, inheriting his house and all of his stuff, which he would share with the boys. He's preparing to sell the land, but as we'll find out in Nolsey's Long Weekend, Norton's house will remain abandoned long after the events of the series. Things are going good in Browntown. Les makes a coffee and rolls what will become his last joint. Spoilers. When suddenly, the tumours are back. <laughs> we'll find out in Jared's documentary that the Lost Season 1 episode would be repurposed in Season 4. And it's pretty brutal. Les tells Quentin to get in the basement as he battles tumours on his way to Donnie's shop. Where he spends what feels like 20 minutes explaining what we've just seen, and they all ride out of Browntown. Les has once again abandoned Quentin. What a shit father. 
Despite the town now crawling with tumours and later Robocops, they apparently have time to party with Sasquatches in the bush. Bit weird. Wasn't expecting such a fucked up episode to be followed by something so cosy, but alright. Donnie leads them to my first bong, and we get a bit of the callback to Season 3's paint sequence. We get a glimpse of these characters' little worlds, with Nolsey on an empty beach, and Sassy... This one in particular comes off a lot differently after watching his show. Or M, the universe. <laughs> well, the first letter of universe is you, Mark. And of course, Les, who again just wants to relax. But he's forgotten something, hasn't he? Oh fuck, winning! You said you'll come back, Lee. Yep, it's a plot point this time. He rushes back into Brown Town to get Quentin. The tumours are gone, with the cops taking their place. We have a pretty fun sequence of Les timing his movements with thunderclaps to mask the sound of his presence, and... We find out Clarence is a eunuch. Les returns home to find it's been raided. His basement is empty. No Quentin, no Glenworld. You can probably read the subtext here. In both a literal and figurative sense, everything has been taken from him. This is all very sad, but as Les tells this part of his story to Pete, he's taking the longest piss in the world. And for a few frames, we see Les tucking his dick into his little shorts. I'm, uh, not gonna show it here, but, uh... I guess that's why they call him Big Les. <laughs> Next, he breaks into Norton's house, speaks ill of the dead, and finds his secret basement. This whole time, he's had ships, weapons, and cameras all over Browntown. The third was even foreshadowed as early as the first episode in the series. Thanks, Quinton. Yeah, what? I saw everything you did on my surveillance cameras. You fucked up my flowers. Fuck off, I did not. Yes, you did. I saw it. It was a bloody teenager's. And for the first time in over a season, Les finally gets to catch up with his father. Oh boy, what a voice. He tells him Norton's dead and he's next. He takes Norton's ship fucks up the cops, destroys Clarence's house for good measure, and follows the rest of the boys up the train tracks to North Queensland, where the king is waiting for him. Why didn't Norton take the Fory cannon with him to Tumor? This episode ends with a message to the viewers from Donnie. G'day cunts, Donnie here, just doing a little PSA. Uh, the next episode is gonna take a fucking long time. Oh, but we want it now. Yeah, well, fucking, you're gonna have to fucking wait, mate. The next episode would take over a year to reach YouTube, the longest wait between installments for the entire series run so far. But in the following June, we'd get our first sneak peek at what they've been working on. So who you been, Les? It's been a while. Oh, yeah, been all right. Other than me son's been taken, me home's been raided, and going to go kill the king, who's also my father, and I'm wanted by the cops for some reason. So you're off to kill the king, are ya? Yeah, ma. The boys reckon that this island we're going to is where he's been on. So I'm gonna fucking... Oh. It's gonna be a fucking kill zone. Death box. Kill. Island. With that, the Tumor Island free hype begins. Jared would spend the entirety of 2018 animating what would be the series finale. The first and a so far only episode to exceed an hour in length. It would be screened in theatres all over Australia, and even New Zealand. I remember being really pissed off when I missed the Melbourne screenings. I still haven't fully recovered. I was gonna pick out a seat next to someone with no food, and pestered them endlessly with, Oh, you should've got some popcorn like me! That poor guy would never be able to watch the series again. I definitely wasn't the only person to come up with that. We begin with Les and his new ship as it's attacked by a tumour. 
Les, seemingly at the end of his rope after four seasons of this bullshit, resorts to his usual tactic of shooting his enemies through the cockpit. After a long walk, we're all caught up. So what exactly is Taipan Pete? Crazy Steve? King Larinox? The Sixth Kingdom come in? He's none of these things. He's a tree. Les never made it to the desert. He's been tripping on Daechura flowers in the bush for the whole season. He's found by the boys who get him cleaned up and dressed. They've been busy. It turns out we missed a lot. This isn't so much Tumor Island 3 as it is Tumor Island 6. While Les was out, everyone else went on this fucked up adventure battling Robocops and destroying three other off-screen islands. But uh... Oh, I wish you can see it too, mate, but you know, take too long to animate. I like how the first act is just this sadistic joke at the expense of the audience. All caught up, Les plays a song. This one goes a little something. What well, this? So does Sassy. And they arrive at the North Queensland coast with Chekhov's nuke, where Warning Guy was waiting. No Sergio this time. Isaac had to move away earlier in the season. While Warning Guy was gone, he was interrogating the Nugget Man, who almost gives away the true purpose of the Tumor Islands, before he shoots himself. Personally, if I was being interrogated and I had a hidden gun up my ass, I'd probably shoot the guy holding me hostage first. Before Les has time to say the same thing, they arrive at the island. The boys go for a surf and Les parasails into the jungle. Him and Nulzi are the only ones to make landfall. Warning Guy stays on the boat, and Sassy and Donnie get a bit distracted. Oi, Donnie. Do you want to hear this new stuff? Or what? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it tastes pretty nice, eh? Yeah, it's nice, eh? Hey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Les runs deeper into the jungle, where he finds Quentin, forgets his name, and runs right into a trap. Finally face to face with the big man himself. As I've already said, Ripstart has kinda made their priorities clear by now with their characters, but... Really? It's the last episode. We're not gonna develop the main villain at all. I think you're the fucking toughest cunt out there, cunt. I think you're fucking Thanos or something. Thanos? I've never heard of her. I don't fucking care about your fucking grand master plans or your fucking backstory or your fucking whatever the fuck you gotta fucking do, can't. Alright. <laughs> the Glendale scene is pretty funny though. Where are they, can't? <laughs> oh, you mean this? Nah. <laughs> They're just toys! They're fucking statues, can Fucking priceless item! What? Is this your favourite one? What, this? Is it? Oh. Oh. How clumsy of me. Speaking of Glenn, that's all Six Kingdom come in accounted for. We already knew he was alive at this point. We were just waiting for him to show his face. And then, the twist. The Tumor Islands are living organisms that once awakened float up into the upper atmosphere and keep growing, devouring nearby celestial bodies. Fucking hell. Glenn and King Larinox are going to resurrect Kingdom Come with Tumor Planets, and Les's doll collection funded the whole thing. Les built Glenworld so Glenn could build Glenworld. Kingdom Come in corporation and state blowing the revenue of the masses on shit that doesn't... Hang on. Did the Big Les show just get political? Because Glenn's a cunt, he deserts both of them on the now ascending island. As of recording, this is the last we ever see of him. Les dies, but not before one last meeting from our old friend, who finally gives us some answers. Type and Pete is Quentin, visiting Les through his trips from a future where he assumes the crown of Kingdom Come and destroys the Earth, for some reason. This was actually hinted at earlier in the season, when Les arrives at the train station, he kinda looks around uncomfortably. He says he never liked the name his father gave him. But why does he want the crown again? I thought he said he just wanted to relax. I guess being around his relatives just brings out the worst in him. Also, he's gonna get a Zenkai boost and wake up as Super Kingdom come in. <laughs> Wait. <laughs>
I'm not sure where this came from. The Dragon Ball influence on the rest of the series isn't exactly subtle, but not even I saw this one coming. They kind of just pulled this transformation out of their asses. I think this is my main issue with Jim Ryland Free. It dumps a lot of new shit into the viewer's laps for what is meant to be the last episode of the series. Probably could have smoothed this one out by taking him back to the paint screen and having him draw himself with big muscles and a golden mullet. But you know what? Find me a better fight scene animated in MS Paint. I like it cause the game like a wet paper towel. Feel the laugh on the thunder! Oh, that looks fun. Can I have a turn? Nolsey saves Quentin. Somehow the buckshot from Doris didn't rip his face off, and Les says his goodbyes, activating the nuke. Warning guy can't pick them up because he's fighting the Kraken, and... <sighs> what the hell? What happened to this guy from Tumor Island 2? No! <sighs> Big Les fans who have made it this far are gonna kill me. Finally, having crippled his father and a nuke on its way to take care of the island, Les gets to go home a hero. Except, not exactly. On his last Tumor Island, he made a bad decision. He may have held the tiny pink revolver of fate on that day, but this season it's Les's punishment for interfering with predetermined events. And today, he... <laughs> Fuck me, that was quick. Quentin and Nolsey jump off the island as Les waits for the nuke to finish the job. He smokes the joint he rolled at the start of the season, and is instantly and painlessly vaporised. <laughs> Among his most cherished memories is beating the shit out of Norton. Ah. In Nolsey's long weekend, he even says Les died doing what he loves by which he means punching the fuck out of his relatives. He died at 420 years old. This whole time, the Sasquatches have been stuck in their weird trip. They get a little lost. Sassy in particular becomes very lost. But he finds this letter and smokes his way back to Brown Town. <laughs> Oh, fuck. One year later. Good job. When they arrive home, Clarence finally snaps at Donny for all the shit he's put him through, and is rewarded with three weeks of landscaping duty, and one last visit from his creations. The remaining tumors have evolved into an intelligent race, and wanted to thank Clarence for giving them life before they left the Earth. It's beautiful. Goodbye. Jared clearly had Jurassic Park on the mind when he made this episode, huh? Unfortunately, since the tumors evolved on Earth, they flo <laughs> they float up into the upper atmosphere and suffocate, I assume. Quentin reads Les's goodbye letter, and the boys go for yet another surf, as Quentin watches from the beach, where they're accompanied by the ghost of Les. He gives a wordless goodbye before cannonballing straight to hell, that's not as bad as it sounds. He met Satan at the SSS meeting, and he seems alright. Now he gets to torture Norton and the King for eternity. It's probably his version of heaven. With Les, Norton, and the King dead, and Glenn and Warning Guy still missing in action, this makes Clarence the last kingdom come in on Earth. Oh god, Clarence is the last kingdom come in. The series ends with Quentin joining the party wave, and thus concludes the Big Les show. Over. But not really. 
Ripstart, if they still even call themselves that, still come out with a new series every few years, and believe me, I will get to those. But I'm stopping it here for now. I can't begin to describe how much The Big Les Show means to me as a creator. The fact that a couple of stoners in high school back in 2012 created such a beloved and long-running series from their bedrooms in MS Paint is no small feat. It might not be the first of its kind, but god damn it, it's ours. It may have started out looking like this and had a little bit of a messy ending, but I truly consider Les to be up there with such icons as, uh... Blinky Bill? The Wiggles? The, uh, I'm struggling. The Australian film industry might be dead, but maybe we don't need it. Maybe all we need is a crusty old laptop and some cones. But, uh, eating is pretty good too, I guess. <laughs>